As I've grown into my role as a parent, constantly fearing something horrible would happen to my 18-month-old daughter, Sophia, a driver ignoring a stop sign, or Sophia climbing up our bedroom dresser, I've realized that most of my fears relate to devastating and immediate outcomes. We bought Sophia a soccer set for Christmas this year, and it made me think of the seemingly innocuous activities which also pose a threat. Volleyball, gymnastics, soccer. I'm not even talking about driving a car or drinking a beer when she's old enough. These activities should be good for her. Healthy, goal-oriented, team-driven, rewarding sports that improve heart function, that reduce the risk of diabetes, and pump out boatloads of dopamine from the substantia nigra. And then I remembered how soccer players have been developing symptoms of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the disease we talked about in a show back in 2016 that was originally observed in boxers and more recently in tackle football players. Now we're seeing it in soccer players, volleyball players, softball players, earlier cognitive impairment, behavioral changes, and a variety of neuropsychiatric manifestations are coupled with this widespread tau deposition and beta amyloid plaques. The simple act of heading a soccer ball, game after game, year after year, is sufficient to catalyze this neurodegenerative cascade of events. In preparing for today's program, which we've remastered from the original 2016 episode, I found a more recent paper in 2018 by Michael Alosco and colleagues in Boston. They investigated the clinical and histopathologic evidence of CTE in a cohort of 246 deceased football players. It turns out, the earlier age of first exposure to tackle football correlated strongly with earlier onset of neuropsychiatric symptoms. Maybe that makes intuitive sense. Earlier exposure means your outcome should take place sooner. However, what happened is, for every year earlier that a kid was exposed to tackle football, this translated to earlier cognitive and behavioral symptoms by two and a half years. And for kids who were exposed to football before the age of 12, this resulted in a 13-year shorter onset of cognitive impairment among players with histopathologic evidence of CTE. I'd encourage you to look through some of these papers on your own time. They're referenced in the program's show notes. But they really make me question, for my own daughter, who loves to kick her new soccer ball around, am I doing the right thing for her? Am I doing the best thing? Welcome back to Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine and all the fascinating science and history that come with it. I'm your host, Jim Siegler, a panic-stricken and overly protective parent. And this week on the program, the neuropsychiatric and histopathologic consequences of mild recurrent head trauma. Soccer, for crying out loud. Don't go anywhere. The term chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, was coined in 1940 by Bowman and Blau when the authors described the case of a 28-year-old boxer whose wife reported that, for the two previous years, the patient had exhibited increasingly childish behavior, depression, paranoia, and many other symptoms. He complained to physicians that he was being poisoned, stalked, and lied to. Initially, Bowman and Blau attributed his condition to the term traumatic encephalopathy, but the fact that he did not make any substantial improvements after 18 months led to the establishment of the term chronic traumatic encephalopathy. More recently, in 2005, a pathologist by the name of Bennett Omalu brought traumatic encephalopathy into clear focus. In his autopsy report of a retired NFL football player, Center Mike Webster was forged into a four-time Super Bowl champion. Omalu shook the ground with his incriminating findings. It is not smart play football. You can suffer permanent brain damage only after one season of football. Yeah, our generation of players just didn't, you didn't say anything. Well, I have friends who are in their 30s who are taking Alzheimer's medicine. The NFL scaled a full-on attack of Omalu's work, vilifying the neuropathologist and casting shade onto his early findings. And even some doctors, they're making decisions about concussions and they don't know the long-range effects. However, the clinical and histopathologic evidence linking tackle football to CTE and neurodegenerative disease is now unquestionable. It's become a who's who of former NFL stars. But you're talking about something more dangerous than cigarette smoke.
Before we go further into CTE and its relationship to competitive sports, I should mention how concussion plays a role. Concussion is neither necessary nor sufficient for CTE, as we've seen in reports of volleyball and soccer players who don't develop a severe head injury or have any clinical symptoms after heading a ball or with a head strike to the floor. But concussion does represent a major risk factor for CTE as it's a biomarker of head injury severity, a one-time concussion event, as we discussed in Dr. Kumar's show on diffuse axonal injury, episode 176, is enough to cause cerebral remodeling with beta amyloid plaque deposition within 24 to 48 hours. And these pathologic proteins do not go away with time. In football, concussion used to be a major concern of what was referred to as the second impact syndrome. This is the reason that coaches pull their players off the field after a significant head injury. Or at least it should be the reason that coaches bench their players following mild TPI. Second impact syndrome refers to the exponentially more devastating effect of a second head injury, which shortly follows that initial head blow. And the second head injury can be a much milder impulse. But even this additional force could be enough to catalyze a chain reaction that might leave a player significantly disabled and sometimes result in death. According to one of the most reputable reviews on the subject, McClendon and colleagues described 17 football players with second impact syndrome. Although the numbers were small in this case series, the results were staggering. Following the second hit, six of these 17 patients died within hours or days, always due to diffuse cerebral edema. Of the survivors, players younger than the age of 20 with two repeated head injuries were more likely to have more disabling long-term consequences of that injury when compared to the patients over the age of 20. Those who did poorly also demonstrated early cerebral edema on neuroimaging. And some players, for them, did just fine, had no long-term sequela. But given that the risk of dying is more important than the risk of surviving with minimal consequences, I think you'd have to be crazy not to pull your player out of the game if concussion is recognized. And then this begs the question, when can you return to play? Some players in this study developed their second hit up to four weeks after the initial insult. So the AAN put out a practice parameter in 2013 to address these and other vital issues. The strongest evidence presented by this panel indicated that all players suspected of concussion be evaluated by a healthcare provider to determine if return to play is advisable. The expert panel also recommended against allowing a player to return to play if the concussion has not resolved, even days or weeks later, which may require the use of neurocognitive testing. The concept of graded physical activity, in which players gradually resume physical and cognitive activity, has been recommended by experts, but evidence supporting this practice is very limited. The number of recurrent concussions does have consequences, and this has been quantitated in a report by Guskovics and colleagues from 2005, the same year that Dr. Bennett Omalu published his original findings on an NFL player with CTE. Omalu's discovery began with his autopsy of Iron Mike Webster, a Pittsburgh... Guskovics and his collaborators distributed a questionnaire to former NFL players and found that two-thirds of players had sustained a single concussion at one point in their career, with a quarter of players sustaining three or more. And among those with three or more concussions, the odds of them being diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment was five times greater than that of players without any concussions. Flat out ball. And there is the biggest hit maybe of the 1980s. No way he can protect himself. Back when we originally made the show in 2016, I was curious, why are we recognizing these complications all of a sudden? It's not as if football was invented recently and we're witnessing the side effects 10 or 20 years later. The first American football game took place between Rutgers and Princeton in 1869. The preliminary arrangements for the game provided that there should be 25 on each side. And the NFL was founded in 1920, 100 years ago. And the name was changed to the American Professional Football Association. Surely, if the clinical manifestations of CTE are delayed consequences of football and other contact sports, somebody would have reported this before 2005. But the thing is, it wasn't really reported. Of course, there were case reports and speculations dating back to the 1890s where players were advised to avoid repeated head injuries in order to prevent traumatic insanity, as it was called. But this was far from widely accepted. Some speculated that the low incidence of CTE before the 1990s and early 2000s 
may have been due to the low number of players who began to participate in football at a young age. Football really was an adult sport for many decades. More likely, it had something to do with the relatively infrequent number of head-to-head -head contact injuries before the invention of the present-day football helmet, which makes many players feel nearly invincible. In an attempt to prevent fatal injuries in football, I have invented this new type football helmet. The first helmet, made entirely of leather, was put to use in 1893 in an Army-Navy game. Seriously though, this helmet should prevent severe injuries. However, the use of helmets would not be required by any professional American football organization until the 1930s, when college football mandated their use in 1939 and use in the NFL in 1943. Plastic was added to the helmet about this time, but these remained brittle, so high impulse head contact probably didn't pick up just yet. Slowed under by a herd of rams on the Cleveland 31 yard line. A precursor to the modern day face mask was integrated into the helmet in 1955 designed by G.E. Morgan. And finally, in 1971, the sports company Riddell received a patent for micro-fit helmets made of plastic with inner cushions that could be inflated like miniature airbags in order to sustain more high-impulse blows. At regular speed, look at the clean hit by Brian Dawkins. Just a great shot. One of those, you'll think about that one later. It'd be nice to see that the implementation of newer helmets, or enforcement of newer rules limiting head-to-head -head impacts, that these advancements in NFL practice could reduce the annualized concussion rate. But it seems that the most significant reductions in concussive brain injuries are the result of rule modification rather than equipment improvements. And this has really seen a change in the last couple of years. The NFL kickoff, which accounts for less than 5% of total playtime, is responsible for 1 in 8 concussions as the kicking team sprints full speed down the field and comes head to head with the receiving players. In the three years before some major changes in 2018, there was an average of 270 concussions each year in NFL football. In 2018, the game fundamentally changed. The NFL changed their kickoff rules to limit running starts from the kicking team, mandating that eight of the players on the returning team line up 15 yards downfield from the kickoff and prohibiting contact until the ball is touched by the receiving team or until the ball hits the ground. This means that during a kickoff, both teams' players end up running downfield side by side rather than running headfirst into each other. Furthermore, the new kickoff rules incentivize touchbacks by giving the receiving team a five yard advantage when compared to previous years. Altogether, these changes resulted in a 35% reduction of concussions during kickoffs. And then there was the use of the helmet rule, also adopted in 2018, which results in a 15-yard penalty as well as potential fines, ejection, or even suspension from the NFL if a player lowers their head before contacting another player. There have also been recent NFL bans on at least 10 helmet designs that correlate most strongly with head impact injuries. So kickoff concussions have been reduced. But also, we've seen a small reduction in concussions on the line of scrimmage. In the last two years, the annualized NFL concussion rate of 270 has fallen to 220. And experts agreed that it's these rules, more so than the equipment, that saved the NFL and its players. But whether this is enough to keep the NFL going, as we still see more than 200 new concussions each year, is another question. The Boston University group has done a great job evaluating post-concussive injury in NFL players. In their DETECT cohort for diagnosing and evaluating traumatic encephalopathy using clinical tests, 42 former NFL players, ages 40 to 69, underwent a number of neurologic and psychiatric batteries to assess for cognitive dysfunction specifically related to contact injuries. The investigators compared cognitive profiles between patients whose age at first exposure to contact football was less than 12 years old to players whose age at first exposure was older than 12 years, kind of like what was done in the study that I mentioned at the beginning of our program. Earlier head injury meant earlier clinical symptoms. And as in that study of 246 deceased football players, in the DETECT study, the investigators found that patients who were exposed to contact football before the age of 12 did significantly worse than patients who began football after the age of 12 in all domains of cognitive assessment, despite the duration of total contact sports exposure. 
So it is not simply the number of years in contact sports which increases the risk of cognitive dysfunction, but perhaps more importantly, it's the age at which you start to engage in contact sports that leads to these neurodegenerative changes. And what's hard for me to come to terms with, as a parent more than a physician, is you won't even appreciate how significant these types of repeated minor head injuries can be for decades and decades to come. Your kids, however, your kids and their spouses, or even their kids, they're the ones who will bear the consequences of this. It's no longer just fun and games. One, two, do you want to come up? All this being said, am I going to prevent my daughter Sophia from playing soccer, or from taking dance classes, or jumping on a trampoline? I don't think so. Research identifying the relationship between concussive and non-concussive brain injury and neurodegenerative disease has reshaped the way American football is played, how all contact sports are played. But it's not all as bad as you've been led to believe. If there's any lesson that we learned in 2020, it's that you can't trust everything you hear in the media. Even from Bennett Omalu himself, who we've credited to linking CTE to football-related head injury. When you play these games, there's no question about it. There is a 100% risk exposure to brain damage. Nowadays, we're learning more and more not to trust his and others' misleading opinions and their bad science. No justifiable reason whatsoever. A child in America today should be playing football. Among CTE experts like Dr. Ann McKee of Boston University's CTE Center, Omalu's criteria for CTE are highly nonspecific, and they can be found even in healthy human brains. Even his original histopathologic images that he published in the journal Neurosurgery have been called into question. There's no doubt that players like Mike Webster, the famous Pittsburgh Steeler featured in Omalu's original case report, had CTE. But the findings and the zealous campaign upon which Omalu has built a highly lucrative career are not in keeping with what many empiric CTE experts believe and promote. Football can never be made safe. Boxing can never be made safe. Rugby can never be made safe. There should not be any heading in soccer. And I'm yet to examine the brain of a retired football player who does not have CTE or other types of brain damage. CTE is real. Don't misunderstand me. But if you want to know the truth, the real truth, you'll turn to the more recent, published, and peer-reviewed scientific literature. So again, am I going to leverage the CTE literature against my daughter and keep her from playing sports? Of course not. What I can do is make sure that she's safe about it. I can make sure she's not running up and tackling other kids on the soccer field, that she wears a helmet on her bicycle, and if she gets into water skiing or snowboarding or base jumping that she's safe about those things too. It's not like I'm letting her run around the kitchen with a knife or she's biting children at school. She's just a kid and I ought to let her be one. That's it for Brainwaves this week. Thanks so much for joining us. As a reminder, Brainwaves is intended for medical education only and should not be used for routine clinical decision-making or for parenting. This week's episode of Brainwaves was produced by myself, Jim Siegler, out of Studio 3 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Music for our program today was courtesy of Chris Haugen, Kevin McLeod, and Maiden under Creative Commons license. Our theme song was composed by Jimothy Dalton. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeon. For more information on what was discussed on the show, as always, please take a look at the show notes and read the literature on your own. And follow us on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio. I'm Jim Siegler, and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>